Near-death experiences seem to indicate that these extensive interactions between certain areas of the cerebral cortex that are highly interconnected, nowadays we would call them integrated, that these areas have integrated circuits, so to speak. And consciousness can still be created even if the circuits break down. Professor Bründrup, Sie sind an der Hochschule für Philosophie in München tätig. Professor Bründrup, you work as a professor at the Munich School of Philosophy. Among your main focuses are the philosophies of the mind and metaphysics, and you also critically deal with the phenomenon of near-death experiences. Such experiences are hard to categorize due to their complexity. Sometimes I get the impression that they are just pushed aside by rather simplistic explanations, like their fantasies, dreams, or just made up. Do we take the easy way out by choosing such simplistic explanations? Well, this is a very multi-layered question. First, even if we had a natural explanation that would be acceptable and within the framework of the current scientific worldview, we just don't have such an explanation. All the previous candidates have failed relatively miserably. But let's say we had a physiological explanation for near-death experiences in 20 years' time. It wouldn't mean that the content of these experiences would be less relevant. For example, when we have a major aesthetic experience of beauty while looking at a work of art, we know that certain areas of the brain are involved in processing this visual information. By doing this, we haven't explained the phenomenon of beauty or the content of the artwork though. The content of the artwork is not a brain state, and the same would apply for near-death experiences. Even if they were unspectacular from a cerebrophysiological angle, but there are good reasons that this is not the case. But let's say they were completely unspectacular. The content of the experience itself would still be spectacular. And just because the brain created this, we can't just reduce it to the brain. This would be my first argument. Secondly, there are various aspects speaking against the idea that we are able to explain near-death experiences with our normal concept of the world when it comes to the body-mind problem, meaning the ratio between the body and the mind. Firstly, the main reason being that apparently near-death experiences occur in situations where the brain doesn't work under normal circumstances anymore. I'm saying apparently because it hasn't been verified, but there are many indications. One of them was a special case that was observed during an EEA study that was done a few years ago. I think it was in Hungary where a near-death experience was dated quite well. The concerning patient had already had a cardiac arrest of three minutes. We know that all electrically measurable activities in the brain fail no later than 30 seconds after a cardiac arrest has occurred. According to today's standard knowledge, everything would have to be completely dark internally. Nothing should happen there anymore because we can't derive anything from the EEG any longer. Well, electrical signals that are given off during the information process in the brain. And still, this person had verifiable perceptions of the world outside that were part of the near-death experience. And that's a problem because the brain shouldn't be able to perceive anything in this state. And the second clue is already indicated as well. There are significant indications, but no real proof yet. That's why we can't examine it scientifically and in a controlled way yet. 
that people have cognitive abilities that extend our normal waking consciousness and also our normal sensory functions. If you like, one of the most spectacular cases is when people who've been blind since birth see a complete visual image of their body and their environment from the outside during their near-death experience. From a cerebrophysiological angle, this shouldn't be possible because the visual center of the brain that is responsible for sensing an environment with items, people, etc. has to be trained. The brain can't find its way around innately. And there is a second difficult aspect, when somebody who's been blind since birth is suddenly able to see his or her body lying there and says, oh that's me, that's my body. Apparently, cognitive abilities come into effect that we wouldn't have under normal circumstances. And they couldn't be explained with our standard neurophysiology. These are the two points referring to your question. One central phenomenon that is described by people who've had near-death experiences is the life review. A panoramic view of one's own life that is shown within a brief period of time and often comes with an evaluation. To what extent have I imposed suffering on a person? How did this person experience the situation? What chances in life have I missed out on? If near-death experiences are triggered by the brain in whatever form, isn't it incredible that the focus of near-death experiences is on ethical and moral aspects? This is a good question. It's one of the main problems of evaluating near-death experiences from a purely brain physiological angle. As mentioned before, near-death experiences are semantically loaded, philosophically speaking. Yes, they aren't just some random and chaotic experiences, they are coherent, they have a clear message regarding the sense of life, the sense of one's own existence. And they move and shake things up so much that it has a long-lasting effect on the person concerned. This is so vast, that they want to change their life more significantly than, let's say, somebody who's had a cardiac arrest but no near-death experiences. And let's assume there have been studies done with rats. Of course, you can only partially apply this to humans, but they found out that the brain of rats is very active for a brief moment shortly after they've had cardiac arrest. You can imagine that the organism falls into a state of panic when the heart stops. However, this brain activity is over after about 30 seconds, as I'd mentioned before. Let's assume a near-death experience had to do with this activity. Why would a brain focus during a moment of panic on ethical aspects of all things, such as where have I loved and where have I inflicted pain, why would the brain do that in such a stressful situation where stress hormones might be released? Let's just say all the areas of memory in the brain that are usually not used in order to save energy, because otherwise we couldn't really function in everyday life. Let's say the neurons are hyperactive shortly before death and all sorts of memories are washed up. Let's assume they'd be chaotic, maybe very detailed, but they'd be chaotic. But where does this semantic, content-related focus come from? That's why we should be able to give an evolutionary explanation that the people who've had a near-death experience have a higher chance of survival because they'd actually just live a few more seconds or minutes longer. It's really difficult to explain. What strategies would you generally suggest in order to deal with this phenomenon of near-death experiences? Just denying or repressing wouldn't really do anything. 
Might it be time to question the materialistic conception of the world? Well, first, let's speak from a philosophical perspective, where I'd say, don't impose anything on near-death experiences, and also don't rush into delivering explanations, such as, it's clear as daylight that near-death experiences are triggered by certain messenger substances that are released. One thing that speaks against this idea is that when messenger substances are released, it's not like a clear on and off switch. A messenger substance builds up slowly, then it has an effect on the body for several hours until the body, the kidneys and other organs, have broken down everything again. However, near-death experiences are like an on-off switch. It's hard to explain that it could happen via messenger substances, so I would be careful with explaining these tendencies too quickly. We should give the experiences a chance to speak for themselves. And I'd also urge people who think they have evidence of the afterlife to be careful. Do not impose your own concept of the world on these experiences. Here I mean both, the materialists as well as the religious people. Let the experiences speak for themselves at first. And as scientists and philosophers, we should stay curious and not just dismiss this phenomenon that doesn't really fit into our standard conception of the world. On the contrary, we should take them seriously. Don't just jump to conclusions, but continue doing research in the hope that we will understand these things better one day. This would be my basic attitude. That means it's not about drawing final conclusions, but it's definitely time to keep an open mind towards this phenomenon. Exactly. Several theories have been presented, but they all have one disadvantage, namely that they either can only simulate certain aspects of a near-death experience or that they don't seem very reliable. For example, there was one patient where an experiment worked, that if a certain area in the brain was stimulated, the patient would have a bit of an out-of-body experience. And when they tried to stimulate the same area again, it wouldn't work anymore. And when they tried to do the same process with other people, nothing would happen either. So those results are just coincidence. They're often communicated as if they were a norm. Exactly. These things are presented in the media as if they were the newest. Let's say a successful explanation. There's a simple reason for this. The media are driven by circulation ranges and number of clicks, and the topic of near-death experience draws attention and generates more numbers of clicks. Some time ago, an editor confessed this to me, and he said that if the numbers were down, they'd do a press release on near-death experiences, and the numbers of clicks would immediately go up again. In plain language, this means that every pig that is readily available is driven through the village in order to increase the significance of their own media organization. And of course, these things don't help science at all. But couldn't this be down to a desire to explain something in simple terms within the framework of an established and familiar conception of the world? Well, I wouldn't just call this longing, but it's completely rational and sensible. It's the established strategy, and if you have a certain conception of the world, such as the sciences that evolved out of the Renaissance and the modern times, then this conception of the world is extremely successful. Maybe not from an evolutionary standpoint though, because it might lead us to a certain point where we eliminate ourselves. But speaking from a purely cognitive, knowledgeable standpoint, it has been very successful. We've learned considerably more about the world in the last 200 years than in all the history of mankind, and it's getting faster and faster. This scientific and technical knowledge is exploding more or less, but it also dispenses certain other aspects of reality, mainly consciousness. Consciousness cannot be grasped by technical and scientific methods because it cannot be observed. I can observe people's body movements, I can observe their circulatory system, their organ activity, their nervous system, but their consciousness is not accessible to me. 
I can only find out from them what they experience. But even then it's not certain if they really experience it. They could even be a cunning robot that was built to deceive me. Maybe this will be possible in about 100 years when AI is more developed. But the fundamental problem is that we can't observe and measure consciousness. This is because of the fundamental approach of the sciences and because we have a hard time explaining all phenomena surrounding consciousness from a purely scientific standpoint. One might get the impression that the topic consciousness is blanked out by the naturalistic concept of the world. Well, consciousness wasn't taken seriously by the sciences for a long time because it cannot be quantified and observed. But this has changed. Scientists, psychologists and neurophysiologists take consciousness seriously again but many of them admit that they cannot or that they are not willing to answer the core problems of consciousness. What I mean by this is the question, how does consciousness actually come into the world, into nature and into matter? So they rather try to explain simpler and easier issues of consciousness, namely what casual connections are between certain states of the brain and certain states of consciousness. And of course, it would be sensible for practical use, such as in psychiatry. It would be important to understand these things better. But even if you discover a certain correlation, whenever there is a certain brain state, there is a similar mental condition that goes with it. We haven't explained the core problem of consciousness. What I mean is, by finding these correlations, we still don't know whether the brain state produces consciousness. When I listen to the radio, there is always a certain voice that correlates with the loudspeaker and so on. But to say that the speaker is in the loudspeaker would be absurd. The speaker is located somewhere else. Even though two things correlate, it isn't clear yet whether they are identical. Does the one thing create the other? Do they have a connection? All these aspects remain open. The question as to what role the brain plays, whether it creates consciousness or transfers consciousness, also plays a central role in the assessment of near-death experiences. Near-death experiences are so important for the body-mind problem because they might potentially deliver an empirical clue. I'm saying potentially because the situation is still controversial overall and rather difficult. But it might be the case that our consciousness doesn't need the complicated and connected activity of the cerebral cortex that we usually connect our consciousness with during the waking state. Near-death experiences seem to indicate that these extensive interactions between certain areas of the cerebral cortex that are highly interconnected, nowadays we would call them integrated, that these areas have integrated circuits, so to speak. And consciousness can still be created, even if the circuits break down. However, then this isn't our normal waking consciousness anymore, which processes sense data, but it's a different form of consciousness. And if this is really possible, our current theory of consciousness is even less comprehensive and less fundamental than we thought before. There is also the phenomenon of a terminal clear mind and, with that, the question of whether consciousness is also produced in the brain becomes very relevant again. A terminal clear mind is a phenomenon where people's neurophysiological machinery, if I may call it that, is impaired by fundamental illnesses that are either age-related or caused by other factors. An example would be patients who suffer from Alzheimer's disease, where these protein plaques, you could also call them depositions, the memory doesn't work anymore. The patients can't control their emotions any longer. In psychology, this is called executive function, which keeps emotions and tantrums under control. 
All these things don't work properly anymore. And it's very bitter for relatives when the patients can't even recognize people they've been closest to. And this is a condition that lasts over several months, which is surprising. And another aspect that is also surprising is the fact that shortly before the patients die, they often have a moment where these cognitive functions come back and suddenly they're able to recognize their relatives again, although they weren't able to do that for months. And they're even able to speak to them in a sensible and coherent way. They also remember things again and are able to retrieve information from their memory, although they weren't able to do this before. And shortly after they die, and this is something that shouldn't really be possible because their brain is structurally damaged. It would be the same as going to a car dealer and telling them, I've got piston seizure, and sometimes the car is still going fine. And then the car dealer would probably think, you're crazy and this is the same problem we've had before. For people who've had a near-death experience, there's often no question as to whether life continues after death. Many of them speak of encountering a light being. Some even associate this light being with Jesus. Many of them mention that their spirituality has increased. What connections do you see between near-death experiences and religion? Well, one thing that is quite remarkable is the fact that people who've had near-death experiences often say that they've become more spiritual but less religious, which is quite uncomfortable for many religious representatives. However, they usually mean, and this can be a bit misleading, that religion is something that is assigned to a certain group. And with these groups, there come certain holy texts and everyone else is excluded who doesn't have this commitment to the holy text. They oftentimes leave this narrow, maybe dogmatic, speaking in a negative sense, concept of religion behind because they think that the reality of spirituality and of God is a lot wider. And they'd like to continue being part of their religion in a more intensified sense. And they wouldn't be able to harm anybody anymore just because the person might be part of the wrong religion. A deeply spiritual person has such a deep, well, they see the same divine and spiritual power in all the other religions too. Even in non-believing atheists who have good intentions to live in a morally authentic way and try to live the best as well, people who have had near-death experiences often think that divine powers and energies are present everywhere. And this broadened horizon is typical for people who have had near-death experiences. Religious denominations often present themselves as focused on the past. Don't you think that many established religious representatives might worry when there are people out there who've had a revelation outside holy texts, so to speak? Yes, that's very typical for Christian churches, such as Protestantism, where it states the holy scriptures only. This doesn't even include philosophy or other sources, but they would experience God and the approval of God just through the Holy Scripture. And then, of course, you're skeptical towards somebody who's had a revelation outside of this Holy Scripture. This might happen a little less in the Catholic Church, but it also exists in form of an underlying idea that there is a fear that private revelations can happen apart from the established revelations of the Gnostic and Illuminatidum. However, Saint Ignatius of Loyola, the founder of the Jesuit order, said that he had mystic experiences that were so enriching that he wouldn't need the Bible anymore. He said he was glad he had it, but he could just live according to those mystical experiences. And this was stated by a saint of the Catholic Church. And that's why you could actually say, there are many more examples. I just gave you one example. I could tell you a lot more, 
But what I'm trying to say is that there is certainly room for this tradition of great mystic experiences in religions. Also in Islam, Judaism, in Hinduism anyway, in Buddhism anyway, mystics have always been viewed a bit skeptically, but they've got their place in all major religions. And I would like to categorize near-death experiences as a form of mystic experience. And a religion's test for mystic experiences has always been if it proves itself to be useful in life. Somebody can claim she or he's had a mystic experience, but how can this be verified? And you can find the answer for this in practically every religious community. If the person changes his or her life completely, because more caring, love, less drawn to selfishness, has less ambitions for recognition and wealth, is less drawn to materialistic goods, the person becomes more sensitive in relationships, selfless and humble due to this experience. The experience was real. And if you use this measurement method for near-death experiences, you can tell whether it was real, because people really change to the positive after a near-death experience, speaking from a spiritual point of view. So, your conclusion is that it is about valuing near-death experiences as a deep mystic experience, even if the phenomenon can't really be explained yet. Or is there another conclusion you would draw? Well, there is always one thing I always say at the beginning. Try to move away from the urge to explain it, but try to understand it first. So before we can explain near-death experiences, we have to understand them first, and by understand, I really mean understanding the semantic content of a near-death experience. They are completely different from experiences with drugs. There, you might have those out-of-body experiences every now and again, but they don't have this clear message regarding the sense of life. There might be one or two drugs out there that are used for rituals by indigenous peoples, such as drugs that contain the substance DMT, which can cause spiritual awakenings. But first of all, the interesting aspect is the content of this spiritual awakening. And if you appreciate this rich content of experiences and understand them, then you can still ask, how does this fit into our natural world? And here I would advise to a sort of intellectual humbleness. Near-death experiences are obviously deeply mysterious. Death has always been viewed as something holy by religions because it is deeply mysterious. Near-death experiences suggest at least that death isn't just a flame of life that is slowly burning down, but that it is once again a phase of life that is of extreme importance for life as a whole. Even if you can't see any of this from the outside, but for the ones who live through this process of dying from the inside, it is of extreme importance and a moment of clarity of the consciousness. And I think that has consequences on how we deal with people who are dying. Oftentimes, we walk around in their room and talk like he or she isn't aware of anything anymore etc. But the contrary is the case. The body doesn't communicate with us anymore, but the mind is wide awake, and it would have practical consequences on how we deal with the dying. You said analogously that it is important to maintain the dignity of people who are in the process of dying, and not just act as if there is somebody lying there who doesn't experience anything anymore. What does this mean for you with regard to coma patients or people who are prepared for organ removals? These are two different questions. Let's start talking about coma patients first and then move to organ removals. 
Coma patients are not in a situation of a near-death experience, but if they have any form of consciousness, it is a consciousness that is similar to our consciousness in everyday life. And I think we'll actually have better tools for physiological research on the brain in the future, in order to determine whether a person is in a waking consciousness. Here, I'm not talking about near-death experiences, but normal waking consciousness. For example, there is a theory of Tononi, which is called the Integrated Information Theory of Consciousness. And there you can even measure how much consciousness is currently present in the brain with the index number phi. This is not an explanation for consciousness, but just a natural law that shows in which form of information processing consciousness is connected with in our world. And so far, this theory has been proven true relatively well. So it's been possible to measure this index number phi in people where it wasn't known in which state of consciousness they were in. And then they woke up and they gave the exact same answer the theory had predicted. So in the future, we could actually develop methods in a more reliable way that might tell us whether people who can't express themselves from the outside anymore are still able to be aware of things. It won't be possible to do that with absolute reliability, but I'm quite hopeful that we will be able to do that. But it is certainly so, and it has been reported by many seriously ill patients that they were in a state of physical exhaustion, unable to move and communicate, but they still were aware of a lot of things that were happening in the outside world. We also know reports of coma patients who wake up again. So if you are in a hospital room with a coma patient, you should never speak as if nobody was in the hospital room, as if there was just an object lying in the room. You always have to assume that a subject is lying there that can still experience things. The patient is in a different level of consciousness. The consciousness may be relatively dull, but the patient is still in an experiencing consciousness that should be taken seriously from an ethical point of view. And we must not speak about a person as if he or she were an object. Of course, we're prone to do that, especially people who work in the care profession, who are extremely busy. But the dignity of people is connected to whether they are still able to experience things. And during a coma, this ability of experiencing things is apparently still present. There is more and more neurophysiological evidence that points towards this, that people who are in a vegetative state or seemingly unconscious are still aware of things. There have been studies done that if somebody was talking about tennis to a person in such a state, and the person used to play tennis in the past, the areas in the brain become active that would be responsible for tennis racket movements. So the information surrounding tennis was obviously semantic. The semantic content was interpreted as tennis and therefore the associated areas in the motor cortex, the areas of movement, were activated. This is a relatively simple piece of evidence that doesn't tell you much about consciousness, but it tells you that the brain of a person in a coma or a similar state processes more than is visible from the outside. Considering your question on organ transplants, you can't conclude from near-death experiences whether the donation of organs is principally morally reprehensible because a person might still be aware of it. Also, somebody who's had a near-death experience can only come back into this world if he or she even ever leaves it. Of course, that's another question. But let's say the person who's having a near-death experience leaves this world in one way or another. Can he or she only come back into this world if he or she has a functioning brain? And if a brain doesn't receive oxygen for 10 to 15 minutes, then it is irreversibly damaged. And in this sense, there is no way back to the brain. 
And of course, then you can also transplant the liver, the heart, etc. Because the brain has been irreversibly damaged and there is no coming back anymore. However, it would have to be verified that the brain is irreversibly damaged by at least two expert opinions after an appropriate period of time has passed because otherwise we've currently had this tragic case that made the headlines. There was a young man that was in a such a state for years, I think, I don't remember the exact time, and the parents decided to allow his organs to be transplanted after a long struggle. And he woke up at the same night and it didn't take him long to recover again, if you may believe the media. However, this story was also covered in respectable media organizations, so I just assume the story was correct. But there was obviously a brain that hadn't been permanently damaged. Brain death depends on whether the brain has been damaged or not. And when it hasn't been damaged, we can't call it brain death. And just because there is no electrical activity, it doesn't mean that brain death has occurred. In many cases of people who've had near-death experiences, the EEG line was temporarily flat. This means that when the cells haven't been damaged, or let's say permanently damaged in its biochemical structures, electrical activity can be rebooted, so to speak. So it's not the electrical activity that we measure in an EEG that authorizes us to declare brain death, but the metabolism has to stop for such a long time that the cells are permanently damaged. And if this is the case, I think we can remove the organs. Is there a possibility to verify this in a reliable way? Well, I've had many conversations regarding this topic, and when this is done in a serious and competent way, it can be verified. Finally, I'd like to ask you a personal question. What prompted you to look into the topic of near-death experiences? Was it purely scientific curiosity, or might there be some experience of your own behind it? Well, it's because I had a near-death experience in the 1980s, and I'd already been interested in the body-mind problem before. Also, my profession was in my blood, so to speak. I remember that somehow. I thought about matter and the mind as a 12 or 13-year-old and about how the mind got into the cosmos. I did that with the simple means of a 12 or 13-year-old, but I already occupied myself with these questions when I was very young. And then I had a cardiac arrest in connection with a serious illness that I luckily overcame. Unfortunately, I received all the needed procedures that kept me alive, and during that time I also had an intense near-death experience. It almost covered the whole spectrum of what you'd call an intense near-death experience, but it just covered it almost. By today's standard, with all the scale and category systems, you would classify it as a deep near-death experience. And it took me several years, about five years, to get out of this experience and back to normal everyday life. I always had the feeling I wasn't quite in the right place. It wasn't that I despised the normal world somehow or that I wanted to escape, but I felt disoriented. I'd got to know a different reality and now I was back in the former world and somehow things hadn't settled yet. And this uncertainty was so vast that it took me five years to sort things out. And at the time, I was already studying philosophy and theology and started reading about this topic. Later, I was appointed professor at the Department of Philosophy and Mind and thus I dealt with this issue, such as the connection between matter and mind anyway, regardless of my near-death experience. 
And so it just happened biographically. So I, well, I think I waited about 20 years after the near-death experience had happened before I spoke publicly about it and told people I had a near-death experience. And I think many people go through the same process, that they're so occupied by processing these experiences that they need their time until they're able to speak about it. Was it difficult to talk about it? Because the term near-death experience wasn't yet around at that time. While it was slowly starting, Moody was already there, but the topic wasn't so known at the time. I was actually surrounded by people in my inner circle of acquaintances with whom I could have talked about it, who would have been open to it. Nevertheless, I think I only told two or three people and it took me a long time. And even today, I still do it with a certain reluctance because there is such a big disparity between what I experience and what I'm able to express in language. They're so far apart from each other that I get the feeling of complete inadequacy. On the other hand, I've experienced many people who talk so much nonsense about near-death experiences. This also includes people who speak about near-death experience and are convinced scientists. I've experienced this at several conferences. And you realize as somebody who's had a near-death experience that they don't have any clue of what they are talking about. That's something you realize instantly. So I stood up and was a bit, ag how should I put it, aggressive is not the right word, but I was more brash and spoke my mind. But these were things that just happened. From your point of view, what would have to change in society for it to be easier for people who've had a near-death experience? I think we should become more culturally open so people have the feeling they can speak openly about this topic or that they get the feeling that other people would like to talk about it. I think it should be important to be more open in the medical profession. I've done a seminar with a cardiologist who used to be an emergency physician for a long time. It would be important to be more open in all the caring professions and also in families with elderly people or people who've experienced an outstanding medical state. To this day, many people are concerned and say, even if I told my spouse about it, I'm afraid that he or she might think I'm crazy. And I think that's something we'll have to get away from in society. We'll have to develop a listening culture that won't make demands like you're crazy and you've had a little too much of X and Y in your blood or in your brain. You're just imagining it. Or it can also be turned in the opposite direction. Well, now that you've been to heaven and the hereafter, tell me what was going on there. These are all appropriations. We're talking here about people whose foundation of existence was shaken up in a positive way. And it would be my request that we can create an atmosphere of trust and listen to those people. This would be my biggest request. Professor Bruntrup, many thanks for your valuable and stimulating inputs. Many thanks for the interview. All right.